Okay, tonight what we're going to look at tonight is justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. We find that in Galatians chapter 5 verse 4. Many times when you talk about the Sabbath, people will say, well look, we don't have to keep the Sabbath because Galatians chapter 5 verse 4, justified by the law, so if you keep the Sabbath, you have fallen from grace. That's what people say. So let's look at Galatians chapter 5 verse 4. Notice what Galatians 5 4 says. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. So see, people use this text to say we don't have to keep the Sabbath. Because if you keep the Sabbath, you're trying to work your way to heaven, you're trying to be justified by the law, and if you do that, you're fallen from grace. Well, there's two main interpretations of this passage. The second one, we're going to look at the end, towards the end of the meeting. But there are two main interpretations. And uh, the most popular, number one, the most popular teaching is, if you keep the Sabbath, you have fallen from grace. No one can be justified by keeping the Sabbath. Now, sometimes in these statements or objections people raise, there are partial truths. And that's what really throws people off. That's what's really confusing, because there is partial truths. For example, no one can be justified by keeping the Sabbath. That's true. But no one can be justified by keeping the first commandment in the law, too. That's true. But they don't ever mention that, see? No one can be justified by keeping the third commandment in the law. You see? Number one... The purpose and function of the law is not to justify us, not to save us, but simply to reveal what sin is. So let's look at it carefully. Del Ratzler says, in the law of Christ, we have moral and ethical principles above and beyond that of the old covenant law. Now this is what Dale says. Now let's go to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1 and let's read through these first four verses. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. By the way, is circumcision something that is mandatory today, is it? No? Is 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 if you were to read the Ten Commandments on tables of stone, the Ten Commandments, would you read anything about circumcision? For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Now see, here's what I'm saying when we talk about the whole law. I believe there's more than just one whole law in the Bible. And as we get into the Old Covenant and New Covenant, we're going to see some of that. But it's interesting because Paul is saying that every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Now notice in this context, now notice what Paul says. Christ has become of none effect, no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now, would it be a correct interpretation... To assume and conclude that the whosoever means anyone and not just the Jews, the Israelites. Would that be a correct interpretation? Can we agree that the whosoever means not any ethnic race, not just the Jews, the Israelites, but whoever, including you and me? So, the whosoever relates to the law. Yes or no? How does the whosoever relate to the law if the law spoken by Paul was given only to the Jews, the Israelites, as so many argue? How does the whosoever mean you and me relating to the law that was given only to the Jews, the Israelites, as many people believe and teach. 
I believe that Christians do relate to the law. But what whole law is Paul speaking of? The key to understanding this passage is found in the terms justified and keep. These two terms have entirely two different meanings. They do not mean the same thing. For example, do you keep the law to be justified? Or do you keep the law because you are justified? Does justified mean that you don't have to keep the law? Does keeping the law mean you have fallen from grace? Or is Paul proving the point of how one is saved? In other words, if you keep the law to be saved, justified, then you have fallen from grace. If you keep the law as a result of being saved, justified, then you have not fallen from grace. This very text that people use for not keeping the law actually proves that the law exist. If keep and justified is proven from the Bible to mean two different things and that they do not mean the same thing, then the whosoever, including you and me, would keep the law. We're going to see that. Listen to this, Romans 4, 9. Much more than being now justified by what? By his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So how are we justified? How are we justified? By his blood. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. This then would prove... Not only that the law exists, but whosoever, anyone, including you and me, in the whosoever is justified, will keep the law. Now let's see how this works. For example, this very text proves the very opposite. Why? Because the same Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 2, to honor thy father and mother. The same Paul quotes the fifth commandment in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Paul does that in, Rome, in uh, Ephesians 6 2. Now, was Paul's teaching a contradiction between Galatians 5 4 and Ephesians 6 2? I don't believe Paul contradicted himself. If there's an apparent contradiction, it's because of people's false interpretation. Wouldn't Paul's words in Galatians 5, 4, that people assume condemn Sabbath keepers for keeping the Sabbath in the law, the Ten Commandments, condemn those who likewise keep the Fifth Commandment, Ephesians 6, 2, in the same law, the Ten Commandments? No different in regard to any of the other nine commandments in the same law as the Fourth Commandment in the Decalogue. How is keeping one commandment in the law fallen from grace, Galatians 5, 4, while keeping another commandment in the same law not fallen from grace, Ephesians 6, 2? Can you see that would be a problem, wouldn't it? First of all, I want to say Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, have never taught that one can be justified by keeping the law. We've never taught that. Many who use this text distort what Adventists believe and teach, including Dale Ratzliff. They are confused and have a misconception of what the word justified means. When a person comes to Jesus, he or she 
are justified. Being justified is offered through accepting Jesus as your personal Savior. And that Jesus died for your sins and that you accept him, how? By works of the law? No. You accept him by faith. No man is justified by keeping the law. No man. Paul's point is how is a man justified? Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Isn't that simple? That's not complex. In other words, the law's purpose isn't to save you. It's not to justify you. The purpose of the law is to simply reveal what sin is. That's knowledge. You see? Simply because a man is not justified by keeping the law, many have come to a false conclusion and misinterpretation that the law no longer exists. Paul's point Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That's in Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. By the way, we're going to go through Galatians. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. And we're going to look at these passages throughout Galatians. But Paul makes it very plain and clear right here. And that from a child, I like this, because listen to how the Bible describes this. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto what? Salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. It's righteousness by faith. It's being justified by faith. It's being justified by faith in Jesus Christ. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Now that's the good news of the gospel right there. Christ taking our sins upon himself. Wherefore, here's how it started. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have what? Sin. Notice how the Bible describes this. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. There it is right there. So once that a man has accepted Jesus as his personal Savior, he is justified and has accepted the gospel, the good news of salvation. There, there it is right there. Very plain and simple. Very plain and simple. So what happens now? What then will this justified man's attitude towards the law, the first commandment in the law, thou shalt have no other gods before me be? What's going to be his attitude towards the law once he's justified? What then will this justified man's attitude towards the law, the second commandment in the law, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image be? A justified man. What will his attitude be towards the law of God? What then will this justified man's attitude towards the law, the third commandment in the law, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them be. What's his attitude going to be towards that commandment? In the law of God. What then will this justified man's attitude 
towards the law, the fourth commandment in the law, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy be. What's it going to be? What then will this justified man's attitude towards the law, the fifth commandment in the law, honor thy father and thy mother be? What's it going to be? What then will this justified man's attitude towards the law, the sixth commandment in the law, thou shalt not kill? What's it going to be? Can you see? What then will this justified man's attitude <clears throat> towards the law, the seventh commandment in the law, thou shalt not commit adultery be? What then will this justified man's attitude towards the law, the eighth commandment in the law, thou shalt not steal be? What then will this justified man's attitude towards the law, the ninth commandment in the law, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor? What's it going to be? What is his attitude going to be towards the law of God, a justified man? What then will this justified man's attitude towards the law, the tenth commandment in the law, thou shalt not covet. What is it going to be? What is his attitude, a justified man? What is his attitude going to be towards the law of God? Now that this justified man stands before the law, will a justified man desire to keep this law or desire to to break it. You know, when we ask Jesus to come into our hearts, we ask him to change the desire of our hearts. The things that we once loved, we now hate. You see? So, so a conversion experience with Jesus would be, transform my heart. Change my heart. Give me a heart transplant. David cried out, create within me a new heart. So once that justified man has accepted Jesus as his personal Savior, and his heart is transformed, his heart is changed, what is the desire of his heart going to be? To have other gods? To, to make graven images and bow down to them? And, and to take the name of the Lord in vain? Is that going to be the desire of his heart? No. No. If a justified man keeps the first commandment in the law, thou shalt have no other gods before me, is he fallen from grace? See, there's only one commandment that people have a problem with. If you keep that commandment, you've fallen from grace. They don't have that problem with the others in the same law. Ten commandments. Just one. What then will be this sinful man's nature that may be purged of his guilt that the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world has been delivered? Amen to that. <clears throat> Leave that old man in the grave. Don't, don't resurrect him. There's a guy on our sites that's a Jehovah's Witness. And... Uh, he makes comments. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about this because in this series, you know, on the Sabbath, we are facing the critics. And so I want to bring up some things here that this guy mentions. His name is John Coleridge or College. I'm not sure exactly how he pronounces his last name, but he's a Jehovah's Witness. And it's interesting what he says. <clears throat> John College or Coleridge, a Jehovah's Witness, mentioned Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10 in his comments. <clears throat> now I want to read the text. He mentions this text in his comments. And this is what the text says in the Bible. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, John here 
a Jehovah's Witness mentions Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. <clears throat> now I want to ask a question. Are Christians in the new covenant to keep this law in Romans 13, 8 through 10? Yes or no? Now I'm talking about new covenant Christians. Are new covenant Christians to keep this law in Romans 13, 8 through 10? Now I asked John College, I asked John College this question. Is Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, the same law as James chapter 2, verse 11? Yes or no? Now, this is the question that I ask him. It's not a trap question. It's not a complex question. It's a simple question. Is Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, the same law as James chapter 2, verse 11? Yes or no? Now, John is a Jehovah's Witness. So I'm asking him this question. Because notice what James chapter 2 verse 11 says. Here's what James chapter 2 verse 11 says. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Now that's what James chapter 2 verse 11 says. Now remember what I asked him. Are Christians in the New Covenant to keep this law in James chapter 2, verse 11? Yes or no? Are Christians in the New Covenant to keep this law in James chapter 2, verse 11? Yes or no? That's not a trap question. That's a legitimate question. Now I asked John Coleridge... <clears throat> Is Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, the same law as James chapter 2, verse 11? Yes or no? It either is or it isn't. Correct? Now here's what John said. Here's how he answered my question. Yes, they are the same. That's how he answered my question. So, Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, is the same law as James chapter 2, verse 11. And John says, yes, they are the same. So, what law is the same law in Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10? And James chapter 2, verse 11, that Christians in the new covenant are to keep? He said, they're the same. Yes, they're the same. That's what he said. I asked John Coleridge, the Jehovah's Witness, so this law that James is speaking of in James 2.11 is the Ten Commandments correct? I said that. I asked that question. John Coleridge, here's what he answered. He said the Ten Commandments are correct. So when I asked him the question, are the Ten Commandments the law in James chapter 2 verse 11, he said, yes, the Ten Commandments are correct. How can you say that Christians in the New Covenant are to keep the law in Romans 13, 8 through 10, and say that James 2, 11 is the same law as Romans 13, 8 through 10, and James 2, 11 is the Ten Commandments without keeping the Sabbath? Think about that. Think about that one. Christians in the New Covenant are to keep the law in Romans 13, 8 through 10 and James 2, 11. The Ten Commandments is the same law as Romans 13, 8 through 10. Then certainly Christians in the New Covenant are to keep the law in James 2, 11, the Ten Commandments. The Sabbath is in the Ten Commandments. Yes or no? And Romans 13, 8 through 10 is the same law as James 2, 11. And James 2, 11 is the Ten Commandments. That would include the Sabbath. You can't have the Ten Commandments in James 2, 11 without the Sabbath. Yes or no?
Tell me if I'm wrong. Don't say James 2.11 is the Ten Commandments without the Sabbath. And don't say James 2.11 is the same law as Romans 13, 8 through 10, without the Sabbath. Because Ten Commandments is including the Sabbath. Without the Sabbath, it's nine commandments. Yes? John Coleridge and Dale Ratzliff both say that James 2.11 is the Ten Commandments. And since James 2.11 is the Ten Commandments, as you say, then the Sabbath is in the whole law in verse 10 that James 2.11 is referring to. So when we define the whole law of verse 10, that whole law is the same law of verse 11 and the same law of Romans 13, 8 through 10 how then can the whole law of verse 10 not include the Sabbath in verse 11 as the same law as you say is the Ten Commandments? Y'all understand what I'm saying? Is, am I making myself clear? So when we look at the law, so which is it? There's the law, Ten Commandments. And of course, John Coleridge said, James 2.11 is the Ten Commandments. And it's the same laws, Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. So which is it? Are Christians to keep the Ten Commandments in James 2.11, the same laws, Romans 13, 8 through 10? Contradiction. Now we're going to see Contradiction. See, after going through that, he clearly states that the Ten Commandments is the law in James 2.11, and he clearly states that that law is the same law as Romans chapter, eight, or chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Contradictions, uh, you know, people in the words they say, their words come back and eat them alive. And they very seldom see their own contradictions. And then sometimes, when you actually point out contradictions, they are in denial. They deny it. So let's look at a contradiction. Now, John Coleridge said this, the Ten Commandments, and this is all on the same video. He contradicts himself right through the same video. The Ten Commandments were only for the descendants of Jacob or Israel. So in other words, the Ten Commandments he's saying is only for Israel. The descendants of Jacob. Not even Jacob, but the descendants of Jacob. So the Ten Commandments only for Israel. Now you can begin to see what's going to happen here. He just mentioned that James 2.11 is the Ten Commandments. And that's the same law that Romans 13, 8-10 is. And Romans 13, 8-10 it's for us in the New Covenant. Now we're going to see a contradiction here. He says the Ten Commandments were only for the descendants of Jacob or Israel. So let's put them side by side. He said the Ten Commandments were only for the descendants of Jacob or Israel. So I ask, is Romans 13, 8 through 10 the same law as James chapter 2, verse 11? Yes or no? There's his answer. All his answers and the stuff he says is in yellow. And he said, yes, they are the same. I asked, so this law that James is speaking of in James 2.11 is the Ten Commandments, correct? He answered, the Ten Commandments are correct. Okay? How can the Ten Commandments be only for Israel if the law in Romans 13, 8 through 10 is in the New Covenant for Christians and James 2, 11 is the same law as Romans 13, 8 through 10 is the Ten Commandments, then why do you contradict yourself? Because that would be a contradiction, yes or no? Can't be both, right? Contradiction. There's even more to this. 
John Kolig said this. He said, the fourth commandment in the law of covenant was abolished. The other nine were carried over in the new covenant. You know, I probably believe wouldn't even have to explain much of this at all, would I? If I just kept quiet and just put it on the screen, you could figure it out for yourself, couldn't you? So I probably wouldn't even have to have much explanation for the contradictions that we're seeing, right? So he says, the fourth commandment in the law covenant was abolished. The other nine were carried over in the new covenant. So according to John Coleridge, the Jehovah's Witnesses, who is a Jehovah's Witness, nine-tenths of the law for the Jews only is in the new covenant for Christians. Can you see a problem with this? So for Christians in the New Covenant to keep nine-tenths of the law for the Jews only, are these Christians fallen from grace? That's what our text is. Those who are justified by the law, have they fallen from grace? So let's put all three of these on the board. Remember, he said the Ten Commandments were only for the descendants of Jacob or Israel. The fourth commandment in the law covenant was abolished. The other nine were carried over in the new covenant. And remember, I asked, is Romans 13, 8 through 10 the same law as James 2, 11? Yes or no? Yes, they are the same. I asked, so this law that James is speaking of in James 2, 11 is the Ten Commandments, correct? The Ten Commandments, correct, are correct. Then he goes on to say this. In the same video comments. I can see a person getting tripped up or mixed up a little bit after going through so many videos and saying so many things because there's a lot of things being said. I can see people getting mixed up from one video to another. But this is all in the same video. And he said this. Only the fourth commandment served its purpose. Then he said... On the same site, same video, the Ten Commandments served its purpose. Same language. Now let me ask a question. I want to ask John this question. John, can you see your contradictions? Plural, contradictions. Which is it, John? The two are not saying the same thing. Are these two things saying the same thing? How could it be only over here if here it's the Ten Commandments served its purpose? Now let's take this a little deeper. Let's look at it a little more carefully. Let's look at it closely. If the Fourth Commandment served its purpose and no longer exists, then the Ten Commandments served its purpose and no longer exists based on John's statement. Yes or no? Tell me if I'm wrong. Same terminology used to describe both. How can it be only the fourth and over here the tenth? Ten commandments. Those two things are contradictory to each other. So if that's what he's saying, now watch what happens. How then does nine commandments exist from ten commandments that no longer exist? Because he said nine commandments were carried over into the new covenant. I mean, this is just a Wednesday night Bible study we're going through right here. Nothing fancy. We're just doing a Wednesday night Bible study on these subjects. So how then does nine commandments exist from ten commandments that no longer exist? How then does ten commandments exist in James 2.11 as the same law as Romans 13.8-10 through 10 for Christians in the New Covenant? You know, I would not, I'm going to be honest with you, I would not be able to defend this kind of teaching. I wouldn't be able to be a Jehovah's Witness teaching this kind of thing. Too many contradictions. 
One minute you say it's, the Ten Commandments is just for the Jews. The next minute you say the Ten Commandments is in James 2.11. That's the same law as Romans 13. Those two do not fit. You either defend one or the other. Both of them can't work. Contradiction? Remember, John Coleridge said the fourth commandment in the law, covenant, was abolished. The other nine were carried over into the new covenant. Friends, don't you think that it makes much more sense to say that the Ten Commandments are in the new covenant? The Ten Commandments were in the old covenant? The Ten Commandments are in the new covenant? So what does this mean? Well, according to this, is this really what it is? According to this, Old Covenant, ten-tenths of the law. New Covenant, nine-tenths of the law. Now, we've been through some of this already. And it seems like somebody would begin to click. It's amazing how you could have nine commandments in the New Covenant from the Ten Commandment Law, but not the fourth one that makes ten commandments. So is this really what it is? How can only nine-tenths of the law be in the new covenant when the Bible says that it is the whole law? That's what James 2.10 says. And if you break in one point of the whole law, which the Sabbath is included, because he even said himself, James 2.11 is the Ten Commandments. Am I making myself clear? See, when uh, John said James 2.11 is the Ten Commandments, the same law as Romans 13, 8 through 10. So James 2.11 to your right would be what? The ten tenths of the law, the whole law, Ten Commandments. But then he has the Sabbath abolished, making nine tenths of the law the new covenant. So I wish he would kind of make up his mind which one's he going to go for. Is this the kind of thing that you cannot defend so is this the kind of thing you'd almost flip a coin in the air to see which side you land on? I wouldn't be able to defend this kind of teaching. Contradiction, yes or no? If James 2.11 is to the right, that's Ten Commandment. If the Sabbath is abolished, that's to the left. He says nine commandments were carried over into the new covenant. Here's what the Bible says. Stick with the Bible. Here's what the Bible says. In James 2.10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. By the way, we know that when you read the context of James chapter 2, we're going to see that it certainly can't be the sacrificial system included in this whole law. Burn offerings, drink offerings, meat offerings, and all that. It won't fit into this context. So, so there must be more than one whole law. Or you're going to have contradictions in here. See, it doesn't dawn on people to realize, to think, that maybe there's more than just one whole law. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, now he goes right into the very next verse to tell you the law he's talking about that is the whole law that he's referring to. That's the context, that's what he's saying. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. And the law he's talking about here, James is, John Coleridge and Dale Ratza both say that this is referring to the Ten Commandments. Not nine. Ten. How can James 2.11 not include the Sabbath if James 2.11 is the Ten Commandments? 
Am I making sense here? Are you following what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? How can the whole law of verse 10 not include the Sabbath in the same whole law, verse 11, that hangs on love to God and love to man of Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. We've already covered that. And Romans 13, 8 through 10. We covered Matthew 22 in a previous meeting. We went into that thoroughly, didn't we? It's where Jesus talks about the two. Greatest in the law. First and second. And we know the second is Romans chapter 13. And we know that. James chapter 2. How can the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments in James 2 verses 10 and 11 be abolished when even Dale Rassif and John Coleridge say that James 2 11 is the Ten Commandments? So this is the, the idea that James Coleridge, or I mean John Coleridge has right here. So you have nine commandments carried over into the new covenant. But the fourth one, the Sabbath, is not carried over. It's abolished. Can you see what I'm talking about here? You know, now if people who are viewing this, if they can't see, well, go back over it again. Slow it down, stop it, look at it carefully. Now, I think some of the people that's making comments, they haven't even really looked at the videos. They say, oh yeah, we've watched the videos, but I don't think they've spent much time in, in really thinking it through. So if we are to keep nine commandments, nine-tenths of the law carried over in the new covenant, are Christians fallen from grace? Isn't it amazing how if you keep one commandment, the Sabbath, you've fallen from grace? Here they could keep nine commandments and not fall from grace. Are Christians any more or any less justified by keeping nine commandments, nine-tenths of the law, instead of ten commandments, ten-tenths of the law? Are Christians less apt to fall from grace by keeping nine-tenths of the law rather than ten-tenths of the law? Would keeping any one of the commandments in the law be fallen from grace? See, that's why we know that the word justified and the word keep is not saying the same thing. How do you keep nine commandments in the same law the Sabbath is in and not fall from grace? And yet, if a Sabbath keeper keeps the Sabbath, they have fallen from grace. How is it that you keep nine tenths in the law without falling from grace? How is it that if a person keeps the Sabbath, one tenth in the law, in the same law that the other nine-tenths is in, that person falls from grace. Well, they could accuse me of what they will, but I tell you what, the Sabbath is a joy. The Sabbath is a blessing. And they could say whatever they want to say. But when I look at the Ten Commandments... And I see the fourth commandment there. And that's the time in which God blessed and sanctified. I want, I want to do that, don't you? Notice what the Bible says. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. How, may I ask, are we to keep nine-tenths of the law and not fall from grace? Nine-tenths of the law in the New Covenant? That's what John Coleridge said. This is what this would be right here. But remember what he said, James 2.11 is the Ten Commandments. 
So how do you fit this with James 2.11? Could you defend that? Would you be able to defend that position? That this is James 2.11. Would you be able to defend that position from the Bible? I wouldn't be able to. Are we calling on the justified man to live in obedience by keeping nine-tenths in the law of God in the new covenant? Is old covenant fallen from grace? New covenant not fallen from grace? When they say old covenant was ten commandments, you keep those, you've fallen from grace. Now, if you keep nine commandments, you've not fallen from grace. Does it make sense to you that if you were to keep the law, Ten Commandments today, that you have fallen from grace while keeping nine commandments in the same law, you have not fallen from grace. Does that make sense to you? Does it make sense to me? What did the Lord say? He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So what part of this lie are we to believe? James 2.11 is the Ten Commandments? Or are we to believe that nine commandments are in the new, new covenant, and the fourth one is abolished? So keeping his commandments certainly doesn't mean you have fallen from grace, does it? Remember, keeping and justified are two different things. Remember what Matthew 22 said, on these two commandments hang all, that's the whole law and prophets and the prophets. Love thy God with all thine heart. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And notice what about keeping the commandments. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Which keep the commandments of God. So keeping the commandments of God is not fallen from grace, is it? Now if you're trying to keep the commandments of God to be justified, then what? You have fallen from grace, correct? Sure. But if you're keeping the commandments of God because you have been justified, that's different, isn't it? Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. So here, the Lord is making it clear there are those who keep the commandments of God. Have they fallen from grace? They have the faith of Jesus. And we're justified by who? Jesus. Blessed are they that do His commandments. Are they fallen from grace because they do his commandments? That they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. You see, we're justified by the blood of Jesus. We're justified by faith in Jesus. We're justified by the faith of Jesus, in Jesus. See, it's very simple. It's really not hard. It's not complex. It's very simple. Either Christians are to keep the law or Christians are to not keep the law. Isn't that very simple? So let's look at our conclusion. When we look at the law, here's what we see. Can't change that. If you even mention the Ten Commandments, this is what you're looking at right here. You're not looking at nine. You're not looking at three, two, four. If you're looking at the law of God, if you're looking at the Ten Commandments, you're going to see ten of them, not nine. So make sure you're looking at it visually. Look at it with your eyes and see what is the law of God, the Ten Commandments right here. 
Paul understood that some would misconstrue his words, that a man is not justified by the law, to wrongly conclude that God's grace frees us from any obligation to keep the law. Paul knew that people would misunderstand that. And a lot of people have misunderstood Paul, haven't they? Paul who knew that sin is the transgression of the law. And that's what James 2.11 says, correct? Paul knew that. Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He knew the law. He knew that a man couldn't keep the law to be saved. He knew a man couldn't keep the law to be justified. Paul knew that. And so, so many have misconstrued what Paul is saying. So Paul, who knew that sin is the transgression of the law, is really asking this. Shall we transgress the law because we're under grace? So here, Paul's point right here, is how is a man justified? That's the question. That's the question Paul's dealing with. How is a man justified? How is a man saved? Are you saved by works? No. Does a man receive salvation by works of the law? No. Wherefore the law is holy. Now, simply because a man is not justified by keeping the law, does that do away with the law? No. Paul says, wherefore the law is what? Holy. And the commandment holy. And just. And good. So let me ask this question. Why would anybody want to do, with some, do away with something that's holy? Something that is just. And something that is what? Good. You know the Ten Commandments actually protect us from deception. You see if a person didn't make a graven image. Then they wouldn't commit idolatry by bowing down to it. Would they? So, see, that commandment actually protects you from that deception. If a person kept the first commandment, then they wouldn't get deceived by many other gods, would they? It's holy. Notice what Paul goes on to say. For we know that the law is what? Spiritual. And Paul's carnal. He says, but I am carnal. Sold under sin. Paul says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Now we're going to be talking in a previous and in another presentation, not previous, we're going to be talking in a future presentation on Romans chapter 7, verses like 1 through 6 and 7. We're going to be looking at that carefully. But it's interesting, in Romans 7, Paul says, I delight in the law of God. And I like this from Psalms 119, one, uh, chapter 119, verse 45. And I will walk at what? Liberty, for I seek thy precepts. See, you know, the real issue is that we're, we're free from the bondage of sin. That's the real issue. That's liberty. Liberty. A man who is truly justified will refrain from transgressing God's law. Yes? So, false interpretation. No one is justified by keeping the Sabbath. Now that's a partial truth, isn't it? See, that's what sometimes is is, is delusional because people think, well, that, that part, that sounds right. And it does. Because no man is justified by the keeping of the Sabbath. 
No man is justified by the first commandment or the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. You see? Because that's not the purpose of the law. That's not the function and purpose of the law. But now when they say this, the second part, to keep the Sabbath is fallen from grace, that's not true. That is not true. Now it would be true if a person was keeping the Sabbath to be justified. But it's not true simply because a person keeps the Sabbath. You understand what I'm saying? True interpretation. Paul's point that if the means of salvation is by works of the law, he has fallen from grace. Paul's point doesn't do away with the law, but rather the means by which we are what? Justified. In other words... If a person keeps the law to be justified, he has fallen from grace. That is the true interpretation. You see that? Did I make myself clear tonight? Did you understand what I said? Now, in our next study, we're going to look at Fulfill the law of Christ. See, people have the idea that if we fulfill the law of Christ, we have nothing to do with the Ten Commandments. We have nothing to do with the law of God. We have nothing to do with the Sabbath. Sabbath is done away with. It's abolished. It was nailed to the cross. And so people will say, we are to fulfill the law of Christ. You see? And so we're going to look at that next time. That's Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. So in our next study, we're going to look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, we are to fulfill the law of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you so much for our study tonight. We thank you for your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. Draw us each one of us here closer to you, Father. We love you and we thank you for the breath of life you've given us. Thank you for your wonderful grace and mercy. In Jesus' wonderful, precious name we pray. Amen.